morning, everybody, and welcome to church. It's kind of a fun little tune to kick things off. A welcome if you are here at the Lionel Campus. Good to see you. If you are watching online, wherever you might be, it's great to have you with us. Man, I hope you are all having a wonderful summer, for real. I hope you're spending time with family and friends and making memories and just having a good old summer. But here we are at church again, and uh, we're going to start off today spending some time singing. You already standing? Let's do it, friends. Let's sing.
for who you are to us. We thank you for the love 
that you have for each and every one of us, a love that is so deep and so far beyond our understanding. And it's a love that we don't deserve, but you give to us so freely. So we're thankful for that. Jesus, I just ask that wherever we find ourselves today, maybe we're walking in joy and triumph. But Lord, maybe there's some of us who are walking in darkness, uncertainty, anxiety, whatever that looks like for us. Would you just meet us where we're at? Would we know that you are walking alongside of us in whatever season we're in? And would we know that your goodness and your faithfulness remains constant? Jesus, you are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of all the worship that we could ever give. So we give that to you today. We love you so much. We pray this all in your powerful name. Amen. Amen, everybody. It was so good to sing with you. You can take a seat. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's great to see all of you joining us right here in the room at Lionel Lakes, but also to those of you joining us online, welcome. If you're part of one of our viewing groups, viewing churches, or just on your own, I don't think there's any better place that you could be than, than right here with us. Uh, but my name is Andrew. I'm the campus pastor here at the Lionel Lakes campus. And people, we're coming off an incredible weekend last weekend uh, because it was our outdoor baptisms that took place, not only at Lake Johanna at the University of Northwestern for those in the Twin Cities, but down in Rochester, we were at an apple orchard for our Rochester attenders. And I've been on staff for 13 years. And every year, I think we've done it. We've baptized all the people. Uh, there's nobody, nobody else that could be baptized and I'm wrong every year. And I'm so glad that I'm wrong because this year we had 1,374 people that took that step. Man, that's incredible to take that step in their faith, to put a stake in the ground and say, my faith is in Jesus. I'm gonna do whatever I can to follow him for the rest of my life. I'm so proud of each and every one of those. And it is a special one, special year for me because of a few reasons. The first being two of those people were my parents. Uh, after following Jesus for a long time. Yeah, that's pretty cool. They've been following Jesus for a long time and changed the trajectory of our lives as a family when I was in kindergarten by putting their faith in Jesus, but it was their year. And I was so honored and, and just proud of them. And they're a big part of our church as viewing group leaders in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. But man, just a, a great moment to be in the water with them. But the other uh, story that I wanna share with you is, is from one of our attenders here at the Lionel Lakes campus, and her name is Sierra. And I met Sierra a couple of years ago when she tracked me down in a, in a parking lot of a driving range right by our house. And she shared her story with me. And ever since that moment, I've just been encouraging her to take that step in her faith. And this is the year that she got in the water. But I wanna share just a little bit of her story in her own words uh, so that you know what she's been walking through. But on March 5th, 2020, she says this, God gifted me a second chance at life. After an exploratory surgery that led me to going septic, I was rushed into an emergency surgery a week later with the doctors not knowing if I would make it out alive. It was that day that I realized the power of our God. As I sat in my hospital bed for two weeks, I started reading books like Jesus Calling, reading Bible verses, and as well decided to start watching Eagle Brook again after attending in high school. This church made me remember I wasn't alone that I had God by my side and a community of people supporting me, even if I hadn't met them. I made it through the most challenging time in my life with the help of God and this church. God gave me a second chance at life and I've felt in my heart a strong desire to take this step of baptism this year. I'm so proud of Sierra as she took that step and so proud of each and every one of you if you were one of those 1,374 people. And we as a church wanna keep encouraging you and coming alongside you in your faith. So don't hesitate to reach out. This is just the beginning. But man, I also wanna just say thank you to those of you who give to Eagle Brook. And the reason I say that is because people like Sierra are experiencing our church and experiencing God moving in their lives and leading them to make a decision to follow him in ways that we can't explain. And you may never meet the people that you're uh, helping to impact through your generosity, but just know that it is having a massive impact as we see more and more people reach for Christ. So I just wanna say once again, thank you for your generosity as you give to Eagle Brook. But hey, right now we're gonna continue our Voices series. And before we do, check this out. Hey there, we're in a message series called Voices, and today we're hearing from one of our favorites, our former senior pastor, Bob Merritt. 
After pastoring Eagle Brook for 28 years, Bob now works to help pastors and churches navigate the heavy load of leading and speaking that can feel overwhelming. Bob's the author of three books, proud dad of two kids and seven grandkids, and lucky husband to his high school sweetheart, Lori. When he isn't speaking, advising, or coaching, he likes to golf, hunt, fish, bike, and read, but he says he won't be playing pickleball ever. So please give a warm welcome to my good friend and mentor, Bob Merrick. Okay, wow. All right. Settle down. <laughs> You've been standing a lot today. Uh, hey, thanks for making an effort to come to church uh, on a beautiful July. I think it's still July uh, day, but it, it, sometimes it really does take an effort to get here. Honored and grateful for that welcome again. Um, I feel very loved and cherished by you, and I love you as a church. I can't tell you what you mean to me. Uh, baptism last weekend, was it just blew me away to see 1,374 people being baptized, and I got to baptize two of my granddaughters, and that was just... Uh, I just love this church. They run up to elevate Cadodio, wherever they go, I don't know, they just run when they get here, and uh, I, I'm just so grateful for, for that. Uh, you know, whenever I'm asked to speak, uh, I begin thinking about what God has been teaching, trying to teach me this past few months, and this past year, I've been gripped by something that, that simply won't go away, and it's the title of today's message, it's called Don't Look Back, Don't Look Back. It's been four years since I stepped down uh, from being senior pastor of this great church, and it was hard. Uh, for a full year, I felt this incredible loss and grief because when you lose or leave something that you love, whether it's a job or a pet or a person, it's normal to grieve that. And all you can do is really just kind of go through it. Well, after a year of grieving, the next thing I struggled with was letting this all go. I, you know, I, I kept wanting to butt in and share my amazing insights with the staff, and they, were, they weren't really all that interested. And I was like, come on, you know, that you, Bob, you no longer work here. And I'm like, oh, well, yeah, I know. <laughs> Finally, I had to say to myself, you're done. It took me three years to let it go and move past it, because as long as I kept trying to hold on to the past, I was going to stay stuck. I had to let it go. Has that ever happened to any of you, by the way? Have you ever lost or left something you love and you felt like you couldn't move forward? 11 years ago, uh, my beloved Chesapeake Bay hunting dog died when I was hunting in Alaska. And so I, I was so hit by that. I took a red eye back home and cut my hunt short. And I knew the only thing I could do to overcome my grief was to get another dog. So uh, two months later, we found a breeder, and the most important thing was, could this dog hunt? You know, there were three males in the litter, and immediately my wife locked onto the biggest, most adorable chocolate lab we'd ever seen, and the attachment was immediate. But again, could, could this dog hunt? The other two were smaller and after watching them, we eliminated one for sure. He was scrawny looking. He had fallen into the water dish. He was all wet. He just didn't look good. Plus, my wife was already in love with the one that she was holding. She said, Bob, look at him. She said, he's the one. I said, yeah. I said, we got to give him the wing test. The wing test is, is when you take a pheasant wing and you see how the dog reacts to it. And we were hoping, you know, the big cuddly one would win. So we brought him out into the grass. We waved the wing in front of him. I tossed it a few feet away. He went over. He sniffed it. And then walked away. <laughs> Larry said, try it again. But this time he just laid down. So I put him back in the pen. 
brought out dog number two. He sniffed the wing. He picked it up, but then he dropped it and walked away. So I put him back in the pen. Brought out dog number three, the one we'd eliminated already and did not want. I waved the wing in front of him, and he lunged for it. I tossed it a few feet in front of him. He pounced on it and brought it back right to me. I had my wife hold him back. I dragged the wing 30 feet through the grass into some high grass. I hid the wing, and with his nose to the ground, she released him. He tracked it. He found it. At six weeks old, he made a perfect retrieve. He was on fire. I put him back in the pen. I said, we got to try this all over again, all three. <laughs> Same as before. Same as before. The first two were just worthless. Had no interest whatsoever. But the one we didn't want was all over it. I was so conflicted, I called my good friend Scott Jordan, who's trained hundreds of dogs, and he said, Bob, you got to take the one that chases the wing. I said, but my wife is already in love with the big, fat, lazy one. He said, he said, is your wife going to hunt for you? I said, not in a million years. So we brought him home. We had to bring him home. The next six months were horrible. He destroyed our house. He put a strain on our marriage. He shredded my Bible, which has to be some sort of mortal sin. Please pray for this dog. <laughs> for months, we look back longingly, thinking we made a mistake. Maybe we should have picked the big fat one. But we had to stop looking back so we could move forward. And gang, I'm so, I'm so glad we did. Because this, our dog Blue, and this is just last fall, he was hot on a bird. Our dog Blue has turned into a champion. His nose is phenomenal. He locks onto a bird. It's almost unfair. I absolutely love this dog. I can't imagine my life without him. And what I've learned after losing my Chesapeake, catch this, is that there's life after loss. There's life after loss. There's joy after sadness. If we can finally let it go and not look back. My dog, Blue, finds his way right under my legs. Every single morning when I'm reading my Bible, this is where he comes. He's my best friend. What well, my wife is, but... <laughs> Close second. <laughs> hey, there's a story in the Bible uh, about the city of Sodom that was so evil. God decided to destroy this city but he sent two angels ahead to warn a single family to get out of town before God rained down fire and destruction. And these two angels came to a man named Lot and his family, and they warned them to leave now. The angels said to Lot and his family, flee for your lives. Don't look back. Flee to the mountains or you'll be swept away. Then God rained down, burning sulfur on Sodom, destroying it completely. But Lot's wife looked back longingly, and she became a pillar of salt. Seems a little harsh. God turns her into a pillar of salt. But what's amazing is Jesus gave a similar warning to us in Luke 17 about the end times when the world would come to an end. And Jesus said, Remember Lot's wife, who looked back longingly. Now, of all, the, of all the women mentioned in the Bible, Lot's wife is the only one Jesus tells us to remember. You would think it would be Eve, you know, Adam and Eve, or Esther, or Mary. Mary. Why remember Lot's wife? Because she, she was warned to do one thing. Don't look back. 
and she flat out disobeyed, but it's, but it's also how she looked back at the city, this evil city of Sodom. She looked back longingly. And we get it, right? When we feel prompted to leave something we love, maybe like our home or classmates or parents or career, it's human nature to look back longingly. Lot's wife was leaving what was familiar and safe to her, even though it was an evil setting, it was familiar to her, and she was so attached to it, she couldn't let it go. I just want to ask you, have you ever been there? Torn between what God is urging you to leave and where he wants you to go? Christine Kane, great author, writes it this way. This is the challenge in everything that God invites us to do. But if we linger in the past, we risk becoming stuck and missing the life God wants for us. Some of you right now are stuck between staying or leaving. Like Lot's wife, you don't want to leave, perhaps, what's familiar and comfortable, and you're afraid that if you leave, you might lose out on something or fail at something, and that fear keeps you stuck. But can I tell you about something about fear? Fear is a normal part of everybody's life. I experience fear almost every day. Fear is a part of life, but if you're waiting for fear to go away before you leave your home or start a new career or find a better set of friends, you will stay stuck and miss God's best for you. Amen. So I just want to ask a question. What might be holding some of us back from taking a new class, from going to counseling, from writing an article or a book, from volunteering for a worthy cause, from reading five God-inspiring books, from asking her to marry you. I actually have somebody in mind when I wrote that. <laughs> he knows who it is. <laughs> or adopting a child. What's preventing us? By the way, one of the ways to know if God wants you to leave something in your past for something better in the future is you will experience fear. Expect it. Is this new challenge big enough to scare me? Because God, God will rarely ask you to do something that's easy. Gang, it's, it's never easy to end an unhealthy friendship. It's never easy to go back to school or try a new career. And don't wait until you're ready. I've, I've never been ready for anything, honestly. I've, I've never felt ready to... You know, lead a church. That was the you know, farthest thing from my mind. I was never ready to write a book or become a parent. I mean, I, becoming a parent just happened, and there they are. It's like, okay, here we go. I have never gotten over the fear of public speaking. But we can't let fear stop us from what God has led us to do. So in the time we have left, I want to touch on two ways to get unstuck. Ready for this? Number one, start looking forward. Start looking. There has to come a moment in your life and mine when we say to ourselves, I am done with the past. I'm done fixating on past mistakes, bad choices, failed relationships. No more looking back. Hebrews 12 says it this way. It says, fix your eyes on Jesus who for the joy set before him endured the cross. I love this phrase, fix your eyes. It's like he's looking up and he's locking into our example, Jesus Christ. Uh, two months ago, I literally got my eyes fixed through elective surgery and the, the surgeon said he'd make a small incision in each of my eyes, with absolute precision, without any twitch, he would some somehow extract my lens and replace them with new ones. It's amazing. I said, what if you twitch? <laughs> he said, that'd be really bad. <laughs> well, the day, the day came, I was nervous because it's my eyes, and I thought it would hurt, so they got me prepared, laid me down, 
The anesthesiologist came in and said, if this IV doesn't put you to sleep, just ask for more drugs. I closed my eyes. I said, more drugs? I need more drugs. She said, relax. I haven't even started yet. But today, I can see 2020 long distance. I'm just using reading bifocal things here. I can conceive, and for years, I'm so grateful. For years, I lived with blurry vision. But after a 10-minute surgery, instant clarity. Now, why was that possible? Because 35 years ago, a young student decided he wanted to do something with his life. And so he went to four years of college, four years of med school, four more years of residency, then 25 years of practice, and 10,000 surgery later, later, Dr. Park restored my eyes. Best thing that ever happened in the city of Hugo. It's the worst happened. <laughs> and some of you are saying, I know what you're saying, well, that's him, he's special. And that's partly true. But I'm telling you, God gives each of us different abilities. God has given all of us different abilities and opportunities that Dr. Park doesn't have. I want you to see what the Bible says about this. We all, those of us who are followers of Christ, we all have a treasure inside us. We have a treasure in clay pots, our physical being, to show that this all-surpassing power that's going to flow out of us is from God. And it's not from us. Amen. He is saying that you and I are like clay pots. Clay pots are fragile and common. And that's what we are. But inside these vessels, these clay vessels, we have a treasure, and it is the all-surpassing power that comes from God. The Bible says those of us who are Christians have God's powerful spirit living inside of us, who can do powerful things through us. But what a lot of us do is we focus on the clay pot. That's weak and fragile. We focus on the cracks that came from maybe being dropped or damaged. And so we think about ourselves, I'm no longer usable. But the Bible says we have a power within us that can accomplish things that are beyond our natural ability. God says in Isaiah 43, he says, so forget the former things. Forget what happened to you. Don't dwell. I love this word dwell. Don't fixate. Don't stay stuck on the past but begin seeing with new eyes because I want to do a new thing through every single one of us sitting here today, standing here today. Gang, I believe God wants to do something new through every person here. But you gotta look ahead and you gotta see it. What might that be for you? What new thing might God want to do through you? Start looking ahead. Second way to get unstuck is you got to commit. <laughs> Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured. He endured the cross. He saw that we as human beings were trapped in our sin. We were trapped in, in our inevitable death that we all face. So Jesus stepped up and he endured the cross. Why? For the joy, for a greater joy. He did it for a greater joy, which is all of us. He did it for us to pay for our sins and set us free from death by breaking the curse of his own death. And because of the commitment Jesus made, Paul said, so let all of us, let all of us run with endurance, like our leader, the race marked out for us. And gang, the race, to run a race with endurance means you got to commit to it. 
So here's the question. What's your race? What race has God marked out for you? The problem is some, some people don't like to commit to anything. They don't, they don't like to commit to studying or rehearsing or working or marriage or raising kids. And they don't like committing to these things because commitment is hard. And it restricts their freedom. In his book, Resilient, great book, John Eldridge writes about a group of hippies who in the 1960s threw off all restrictions. They moved to the island of Kauai. And in a spirit of total freedom, they lived naked in tree houses. It was called Taylor Camp. And it was the ultimate hippie fantasy. Eldridge writes these insightful words. Honestly, it sounds pretty good at first. Living in paradise, no nine to five job, no mortgage bills or worries, just lie around, play music, have sex, and romp in the ocean, naked and not afraid. But the drug abuse and sexual foraging damaged a lot of people, and many never recovered. One person said, most of my friends died of overdose. Some are still in mental institutions. He says, I barely escaped. Taylor Camp eventually came to a violent end and was burned to the ground. Why? Because freedom without commitment is not freedom. Freedom without a commitment to marriage is destructive. Freedom without a commitment to friendship to work, to faith, leads to loss and regret. Gang, I believe this to the core of my being. The secret to joy and fulfillment is commitment to your faith, spouse, family, work, and a few close friends. It's not freedom from those things. It's a commitment to those things. I can tell you every joy I've ever had in life came as a result of a deep commitment to my faith, my family, and my career. It came by running my race with endurance. So again, what race has God called you to? And will you run it with endurance? In his book, The Second Mountain, David Brooks writes these great words. He says, people who radiate permanent joy, look at this, People who radiate permanent joy have given themselves to lives of deep and lasting commitments, which is why many people today are not experiencing joy. By avoiding any sort of commitment, they've detached themselves from family structures, honest work, and a community, a community of faith that keeps them whole. So what some people do is they make Half-hearted commitments. You know, don't want to commit to marriage, really. So I'll just sleep around and maybe live with somebody. Don't want to commit to family or friends, so I'll just use people for my advantage. But half-hearted commitments leave us empty and ultimately alone. Uh, my son and his wife, Sarah, have four kids, and their third is a little girl whose name is Tommy, and she's absolutely full of it. I'll let you figure out which one Tommy is in these three pictures. But like all good parents, uh, <laughs> like all good parents, David and Sarah have enforced the helmet rule while riding their bikes, and it's been drilled into them. And so one day, I pulled up to their house, and David was outside looking rather frazzled like the kids had gotten the best of him, and I said, I just simply said, what happened? He said, well, <clears throat> Hank fell out of a tree, so I was trying to manage that chaos. When I looked over, and Tommy was riding her bike buck naked <laughs> with her helmet on. Completely, absolutely naked, he said. She had taken off all her clothes and diapers, laid them in a pile, and was wearing nothing but a helmet. 
she figures as long as she's got her helmet on, on clothes are optional. <laughs> Not a problem when you're two, but when you're 22, you know, maybe I'll get a job, but a full 40 hours of honest work, eh, uh, optional. You know, maybe I'll attend church once a month, but every week, nah, optional. Maybe I'll get married, but if it gets too hard or too boring, just move on. By the way, I, I know that some of you have gone through divorce. Please hear me. God loves you deeply. God forgives. I've made mistakes. All of us have made mistakes. Sometimes it doesn't work. So forgiveness is free. There are consequences that linger, but God loves you. Don't ever question that. You know, over the years, people have come up to me for advice. And they just kind of spill it out. They've made a mess of things. And there's nothing really I can say to fix it and make it all better. But what I do say is something like this. I say, look, I know it's a mess. And you'll have to deal with the consequences. But the worst thing you can do is keep making those same mistakes over and over Put a stake in the ground today. Leave your past behind and say no more half-hearted commitments. No more bouncing from one bad relationship to another. No more making the same mistakes over and over. Fix your eyes on a worthy goal and don't get pulled back into the ditch anymore. Fix your eyes on our leader. Fix your eyes on Jesus will lead the way. 15 years ago, our son-in-law, Nellie, fixed his eyes on becoming a doctor, and honestly, I gave it a 50-50 chance. My wife said I shouldn't have said that, but <laughs> it's true. But after years of med school, an internship at Mayo, Mayo Clinic, four years of residency, a one-year fellowship, a mountain of debt, he did it. He became a radiologist, and we are so grateful and so proud because he's had to overcome a lot in life. A dad who left when he was one, raised by a single mom, not a lot of support. A couple of years ago, he was coming home from work and he, and he called me and I said, how, how was your day? And he said, well, I hadn't even clocked in yet, but I was sent to do an emergency liver biopsy on a 60-year-old man to see if his liver was viable for a transplant harvest. I said, not many people start their day doing a biopsy on a guy who'll be pronounced dead after you're done. He said, Nellie, Nellie said, it puts life into perspective. I said, what do you mean? He said, what really matters? We, we get all wrapped up in chores, projects, little nagging pressures at home. But what really matters is my wife and kids. And then he said, I was listening to one of Pastor Mark Batterson's books on the way to work. It's a 20-minute drive so I can get through one chapter every drive. He said, Mark was talking about a man who was given six weeks to live, but then he survived. And the man told how it changed him to be thankful for each day. What really matters? The so what of it all? And then Nellie said, 10 minutes later, I was doing a biopsy on a guy whose life was ending. And I just felt God speaking to me through Mark Batterson's words to help me face my day and be a source of hope to those lives who are in crisis. Nellie said, to think that I could have just fell into my day listening to KQRS or some other stupid banter. What a miss that would have been. I love that he starts every day trying to hear what God has to say to him. And he does this every day. Fixing his eyes on Jesus. Looking forward to whatever new thing God has for him. And so I just wonder, 
What new thing might God want to do in your life? If you're stuck on something in your past, like a relational failure, a bad memory, loss of a job or a friend, maybe it's time to look up. Get your eyes set on Jesus, who loves you. He's crazy about you. He went to the cross, suffered, was beaten, died, spilled his blood to save you and me. Fix your eyes on him who loves you, can heal you, has the power to heal you, forgives you. And then move forward, make some commitments that will help you get unstuck and experience the new thing God has for you. I'm a little embarrassed to admit this. Uh, last summer I played golf four to five times a week. And you know what I found? It was really fun. It was fun. Spent five hours a day doing something I love, getting in a good walk, come home, take a nap, repeat it every day, all day, all, all summer long. It was a ball. But here's what I also discovered. It was fun, but it wasn't fulfilling. For me, Golf is a completely self-indulgent, I do it for me, and I love it, but I do it for myself, and while it was fun, playing that much every single day did not make me happy, it left me feeling empty. I discovered that there's not enough of me to fulfill me. That if I try to serve myself and it's all about me, what I can gather, what I can do for myself, what I can get, if it's all about me, there's not enough of me to satisfy the void that I have in my life for the God who loves me and for a purpose that he put me on planet earth. That the words of Jesus are absolutely true that in order to find your life, you must lose some of your life. So I made a decision to lose some of my fun and play less golf. I still play. <laughs> Playing tomorrow. <laughs> but I made a decision to lose some of my fun and selfishness and make a commitment to pastors and churches who need some help. And I can tell you, it has been the most fulfilling, most purposeful, most rewarding thing I have done in four years. Because what Jesus said is true. To find life, you got to lose some of yourself. Anyone here need to find a new life? Restore your life. Fix your eyes on him. Make some commitments. I want to leave you with three questions that maybe you can think about on the way home today. Is there anything holding you back? Could be a regret, a loss, a memory. Is today the day that you're going to leave that behind? Leave it at the feet of Jesus. And then what new thing might God want to do in you and through you? Let's pray together. Father, thanks so much for these words that you spoke to me over the past few months. I had to get my eyes up. I had to shift the way I was doing life. And I had to make some commitments. God, thank you for leading me and loving me the way you do. And I pray that for every person here. In Christ's name, who led the way.
Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks.